Hello, my name is Julian Konkel. I am a lecturer in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Reading. Normally the following presentation is given during our visit days. The purpose of the presentation is to give you an impression how we are teaching at the University. The presentation covers the first lecture in the programming module that I teach in part 1, which means it's the first year of the bachelor degree. While the lecture aims for students in computer science, the topic is typically well understood also by parents. Therefore, I want to encourage you to actually listen and enjoy the presentation. I also believe this presentation, which covers algorithm, is really relevant for everyone, as there exists some confusion about the term in the media and pop art. So, a short disclaimer. Due to time constraints, there are some minor modifications to the presentation, in contrast to the real lecture, such as I didn't add slides covering learning objectives and outline. Also, due to the nature of this video, the active learning elements cannot be realistically covered. Normally, I would initiate a discussion at some slides and give the attendees time thinking and discussing these aspects with their peers, while I would listen and comment to individual groups in the lecture hall. And then we would sum up together our findings. Instead, as this is a video, I will ask you in, at these particular slides to pause the video and think about these questions for a couple of minutes by yourself and then I will kind of reveal and give you the answer. So now let's get started by creating a semi-realistic scenario for the lecture. You just entered the hall. I am there in front and I'm saying, welcome. In today's lecture, I will give you an introduction to the topic of algorithms. So let's get started. First, we have a look at a wider definition of algorithms. So the Merriam-Webster says an algorithm is a procedure for solving a mathematical problem in a finite number of steps. Wow, that sounds really complicated. We can translate this a little bit into an easier, more typical uh, notation by saying it's a step-by-step -step procedure for solving a problem. That sounds much easier to comprehend. To mention a very famous computer scientist, Donald Knuth, he said, algorithms are the threads that tie together most of the subfields of computer science. And by that, I really want to motivate you that this is really an important topic. It brings together all the flavors, all the different subfields of computer science. Therefore, I hope if you have any questions, you would bring them up as soon as possible. So now, let's take this really high wake definition of algorithm and frame it for our purpose. So what we'll do here in this lecture is we'll say an algorithm is a sequence of unambiguous executable steps that define a terminating process for solving a problem. So that looks as follows. So we have basically input data, that is all the information relevant for a problem. Then we run the algorithm and we generate an output, which is our solution. So the input that we have is taken from a specific set of objects and the output kind of relates to the input to some extent um, and is really what we expect from the algorithm. So let's kind of decipher a little bit this sentence of the, our definition. We can extract three properties that are important. Definiteness, effectiveness and finiteness. So definiteness means each of the steps the algorithm performs must be precisely specified and unambiguously. Effectiveness means we must be able to perform these actions so that are so basic that they can be done in a finite amount of time. And finiteness means, well, we must produce some kind of output. Well, let's have a deeper look into these properties during some of the examples that we will look at. Now we would approach question time. So think a moment for yourself taking this really abstract definitions of an algorithm. Can you give an example for an algorithm? Maybe you have executed an algorithm. Think about it. What kind of algorithm did you execute? Did you execute any? 
Take one minute at least, pause the video now and have a look. Let me go back to this slide here. Think about this kind of properties. Think about the algorithm. And now have a look at the clock. Good, welcome back. I hope you had a look at this examples and thought about an algorithm. Indeed, I am 100% sure you applied algorithm. They are basically everywhere in your daily life. When you follow recipes, when you make a cake, when you bake, when you cook, even when you shower, make a coffee or drive a car, these are all algorithms that basically, let's take the example of a cake, right? You take as an input the description of how to make the cake together with all the ingredients. You run the algorithm, which is basically encoded in this description as a human, right? You would run this description. And as an output, you basically get the, the tasty cake, I hope. So we have ever, everyday activities. But if you think also about now embedded systems as something as simple as an elevator, a lift, right? You push a button, hopefully the door opens and you can, you know, go up and down in, in a building. That is very basic, but it's also a very simple algorithm. When you think about your smartphone, use some kind of biometric identification, face recognition or your fingerprints. These are highly complex algorithms. Also some simple mathematical um, algorithms like if I give you two numbers, which one is the bigger one? This is an algorithm. How to compute the circumference of a circle? It's another algorithm or by very simple ones. So now that we've seen some examples, let's dive into some additional properties of algorithms. Firstly and importantly, well, they must be correct. So that means for any of the input that I give you that is valid, I expect the output to be as expected. So if you think about the Kate example, you are a good cook, I give you the right ingredients, well, the output is a proper cake, right? Always there comes out a proper cake. So we assume that an algorithm is correct, otherwise you would you know, change it such that it always produces the correct input. Assume you do an addition, right? Another stupid example. You do addition of two numbers, but the algorithm that you use doesn't guarantee that the result, the sum of two numbers, is really the expected number, right? Three plus five, well, is five, for example. That is a broken algorithm. You need to fix it. So all algorithms must be correct. We assume that is the case. Secondly, machine independence. So from an algorithm, we assume that this description of an algorithm that we provide is independent or of what kind of hardware executes it. So to take it into real world example again, I give you the description of how to bake a cake and I give you all the ingredients. I assume the output is the same as I give it to a five star cook. Well, you know, in reality, there might be a tiny difference here. But I hope you, are, you see the point, right? Um, if, you, if you, another example, if you uh, go for, um, if you do the addition, right? If you do the addition as a human, it should be the same output as it's done by a calculator, right? It shouldn't differ. So it's really machine independent the way you do it. Okay, um, and it also adds into the terminology of programming language a little bit, because we assume that the algorithm is independent of the programming language that it, it will be written in. Lastly, for algorithms we assume they are efficient. And in computer science there are two types of efficiency in terms of runtime. So we want that an algorithm doesn't run really forever basically. It should have a very short runtime depending on the input. And also in terms of required resources such as memory, which is the space complexity. But more about that will be later in the lecture. But efficiency is important, yeah? So now that we have, un have understood hopefully the basics of algorithms, there is a 
a theorem that really brings together how we write algorithms. It's called a structured programming theory. And it states that all algorithms of computable functions can be specified by composing simple tasks or actions into more complicated tasks by just using three constructs. You have sequence, selection and iteration. So basically that means, let me repeat, if you understood those three very primitive constructs, then you are able to formulate and execute all imaginable algorithms that exist. Isn't that beautiful? I find it great. So let's dive into those three little constructs. Let's start with sequence. Sequence simply performs one step after another. So each step is executed in a specific sequence. So we say something like do this, then do that, then do this, right? In exactly this order. Sometimes we use numbering. Here's a very, very simple um, problem or algorithm for solving the problem thirsty. If you are thirsty, what you can do is, well, firstly you open the fridge, then you take the milk and finally you drink the milk. Any other order doesn't make sense. You cannot drink the milk without opening the fridge and taking the milk, right? So the order really matters and the order is typically des described by the designer of the algorithm and we saw that it doesn't work if you change the order in this particular example. Secondly, is selection. This is a decision-making construct. So you can make yes, no or true, false decisions logically. So let's think about this condition. If something is true, then take this action. If something is not true or otherwise, right, then you say take that action. Okay, so basically you have come to this decision point and you make this decision and change the way you act depending on the condition. Very simple example, right? If it rains, which sometimes happens here in Britain, then you take a raincoat and an umbrella maybe. Otherwise, you may say take na na neither, right? Now you could combine this with sequence, for example, to say, well, if it, what happens if it, if it is then, for instance, sunny? You could make the same decision, right? You could say, if it's sunny, well, maybe you should take sunscreen, right? So you have basically two kind of decisions that you could check one after the other. Okay, selection is often called conditional statement in programming languages. So the final concept is iteration, by which we repeat a sequence of actions based on a condition. So the term iteration comes from the word reiterate, which means to repeat something, and it means we loop through a given set of constructs multiple times. There are two types of iterations. One is an explicit number of iterations. So we repeat something n times, for example. So for instance, I could say, well, repeat a given action x times where x is the number of people in the room. To make this more specific, let's say I want to give everyone in the room a, a sheet of paper. Each one gets the same sheet, but I have a large number of those sheets. So I say for each of you in this room, you should get one of the sheets, right? Okay. And I'm, of course, I know how many people are in the room by looking in the room. There could be also an implicit number of iterations. So as long as something is true, keep doing this which is some set of actions, otherwise you stop. So you, a very good example that I like for my children is, while it is sunny, keep playing in the garden, right? Very simple instruction. You give to your child and sometimes, well, actually it works that way, right? Once it gets dark, because it gets night or it starts to rain, hopefully they will stop and, you know, come back to you. But as long as it's sunny, they continue to play in the garden. So, thanks to this little theorem, we can now think about how to describe an algorithm and see more examples to illustrate the behavior. So, why is describing an algorithm really important? It's really important because we want to share 
algorithms and we want to be able to understand and execute algorithms that have been formulated by other people. So the good thing is now, thanks to this structured programming theory, we just have to think about those three concepts, sequence, selection and iteration. And once we are able to describe each of them individually, we basically have solved the problem. And there are various ways of expressing an algorithm. In textual form, we can write it as natural language, like in English text. We can use pseudocode, which is something that is close to programming code, closer to programming code, but also a mixture of natural language. And finally, we have a programming language. And you know, what is actually a programming language? You can think of it like it's an algorithm that I write down, and it then can be executed by the computer. Isn't it great? If you write down this algorithm, really bulletproof, the machine executes it for you. So you can save, use your time for doing something more enjoyable. Okay? There are also graphical ways of representing algorithms. And one aspect that we think about when we describe an algorithm is th the way we represent the algorithm is the quality that comes with such a representation. Because we, we must understand as, as people, we want to understand those descriptions, to share them without explaining, you know, thousand times how exactly we, what kind of notation we use. So it should be very self-explanatory. Also standards play a role because that is what people expect for such a description. Note though that all algorithms must share these properties, definiteness, effectiveness, so let's look at an example in natural language. This is actually a recipe which all these recipes can be considered as a more or less standardized description. So in, in, a, in a cookbook, if you take a cookbook, you find different ways of describing different recipes. So between the cookbooks there might be differences, but typically within a cookbook it, it, it looks very similar. So there is some kind of standard established within a cookbook. So in this particular recipe, we see this is hummus and tomato pasta. We see a short description, we see ingredients, and we see a set of steps. Okay, so that's basically a description. The algorithm is encoded into those steps, right? What do you have to do? As this, at this point, I would ask you to consider this kind of group work and think about this description whether or not this is a good description for an algorithm. So if we think about a good description, then we have to check the requirements. So the definiteness, effectiveness, infiniteness. So check those questions here that I've put on and compare them with the steps. And finally, I ask you to think about how understandable is the algorithm for you? Can you execute it? Are you able to execute it? And you should take about three minutes and then we'll discuss it. So pause the video now. Welcome back. I hope you had spent some time thinking about it. Let's have a look at some thoughts that I've put down. They are not comprehensive in that sense because there are more things you could think about, but they give you an idea. So let's discuss this description in general. So first of all, we saw in this general description, well, the output. It's humus and tomato pasta is supposed to be the output and it serves two people. Also, we get an information about the performance. This is about 20 minutes, a 20 minutes dish. Very useful um, for bachelors, I can tell you, if you have those performance numbers, right? because you don't want to spend hours in your kitchen <laughs> preparing those dishes if you are alone. Okay, next you see the ingredients. They are in fact some kind of input. Okay, so we see all the different ingredients and the amounts. Let's assume we understand them. Let's lo look at the, the actual most important part of the algorithm, which are the steps. So add the pasta to a large pan well, we, ha we have to ask the question, what means large pan? Well, I could kind of infer, well, it should cover all the pasta to some extent, right? It should fit in. And then we add boiling water. Hopefully we know what boiling water is. 
but I suppose everyone knows that, so that's reasonable. Then we simmer for 10 minutes, that's good. The next step is fry the cumin in the olive oil for two minutes. And me, that is not so, you know, perfect in cooking, I would ask, in another pan or do I add it to the same pan, you know, the large pan here? Well, it's not actually precisely specified here, which is an issue when you think about the definiteness of an algorithm. And also, let's think about the effectiveness. Which means, if you think, go back, I see each step basic enough and can be executed in practice. So far, yeah, you could, you know, we can do the first step, we can do the second step, add the onions and fry gently. I don't quite know what gently means necessarily, so that needs some more specification. Um, then I stir the tomatoes and the humus. At this point, right, I wouldn't know in which of the pans. Presumably it's in the pan with the cumin, which is another pan, I don't know. And now comes the point, and leave to simmer until done. This is a point where I often fail as a cook. I have to admit that, right? Um, the problem is, how do I know when it's done? So that means it's not well specified in terms of eff effectiveness. It's not basic enough that it can be executed in practice. Also, the finiteness, when does it terminate, is not determined, right? Finally, we serve the pasta and add the sauce. Well, I could ask, is it in the second pan? So you see, I raised here some points. They might be very individual, very subjective to my personal observation, but that means, for me, cookbooks are actually not written by computer scientists and not well specified. I'm sorry for that. And, and that leads to the problem that I have when I cook such a meal, that I make mistakes. Okay. So I have also this very nice video here that I will, will now include here um, a snippet. This video shows the literal execution of instructions for making a peanut butter jelly sandwich. I found it really funny and you can click on the link, I will post the link underneath, uh, that you can watch the video. Okay. Normally I would integrate it, but I think it's um, much nicer to the, um, you know, to this um, YouTuber to uh, give you the link. What you learn from this video is basically it's not easy to write down algorithm. It's really, really hard. Okay. But that's the point of this course. As part of this programming module, we will learn to actually execute algorithms written by other people, other computer scientists, standing on their shoulders of giants, so to speak. And we will also learn to write down e our own simple algorithms for performing some little tasks. And you will see that it's not easy to write those down, those algorithms. Okay, so I hope you watch now the video or watch it afterwards, up to you. And let's go on. So we looked at natural language, now let's have a look at pseudocode. So pseudocode is different from natural language, that is a semi-formal representation of an algorithm. Semi-formal means it's partially formal, means well-defined, clear representation and so on. And pseudo means it's false or pretends to be code, but it not, doesn't mean it's code, right? So it pretends to be computer code and it uses constructs of programming languages and we know we just need three constructs, right? We need basically to have our sequence, we need to have our um, iteration and we need to have our condition situation. So here's a pseudocode how to start a car. So, and we can read it step by step and assume this is the sequence we have to execute it. So we start by inserting the key in the ignition, then we turn the key to start position and then while, means as long as this condition hasn't held, which means as long as the engine hasn't started, we do the following sub actions here, right? We hold the key in start position, we wait three seconds, and then if the engine hasn't started, then, well, some, there was a problem, so we 
probably turn it off. We wait a couple of seconds for the car to cool down and try again. Maybe the battery is low and so on. This is an example. There are many ways of expressing pseudocode. This is not well standardized in that sense that you have very different representations. But computer scientists, they will typically understand this pseudocode much better than having such a set of steps, which are really long sentences and not well defined. But here it's clear you do one step after the other and you have some constructs coming from programming languages. Some of those pseudocodes are closer to programming language and some are closer to natural language and they can really be mixed in and enrich further and further so I can take this pseudocode and enrich it until I actually get to my code which then can actually be run on a machine and perform the operation. Okay. So um, some really uh, careful observer may say there is an issue with this algorithm. Yes, indeed it is. So if you, have, if you have some time, think about this algorithm and think about the three properties. What kind of problem this algorithm here, particular, you know, this kind of iteration here, may have. Think about your car, what sometimes happens with the car. All right. You can pause the video as well if you want to think. So the answer is that this algorithm doesn't necessarily terminate. Because if your car engine is broken, you would infinitely try to basically turn it off and on again. Right? That means this algorithm doesn't terminate and in that strict sense it's not a proper algorithm. Because it must terminate for all proper conditions. And in reality, <laughs> you would of course try a couple of times and then you would call your um, garage to you know, pick up your car or you know, changing the battery, you would try to do something. So here's an issue that needs to be fixed and you can easily fix that, I suppose, in real life. And so it's easy to, for us to write down this little pseudocode and modify it to make it work. And I'll give you an example in a minute. Okay, so if you think about graphical representation or visual representation of algorithms, there are flowcharts. They are an alternative to pseudocode and it really serves the purpose of communication. Because for some people it's much easier to grasp the idea of an algorithm when you show them you know, a visual representation than instead of showing them some text. They are well defined and standardized. They use easy to understand symbols to represent the steps. And the visual elements to represent the constructs of programming languages. So we have our decision or selection um, kind of construct here. We, we also have a way of indicating the control flow, which means the sequence, things happen, and we perform tasks or activities as individual steps. So let me show you an example to explain it. So how to start a car? We, here we have our algorithm, slightly modified. We start here from this, we insert the key, we turn the key to the start position, and we get to this connector, which means we just continue, you know, towards the arrows. Has the engine started? Yes, we are done. Algorithm is complete. The output is a running car, basically. If not, you know, we hold the key and then we check, has the engine now started? If yes, we basically are done. We can check, we check again if it has started and so we go to the end. We could also draw, of course, from here directly an arrow down if we wanted, but well, here, the reason why it hasn't been done is the way the graphic has been designed. And you see basically the sequence, so you do this action, then you do this action, you do this action, then you follow this arrow, and you come back to this check. As you can see, there is no direct iteration construct needed, because basically the selection allows us to repeat steps. Okay? Something we will see later. Okay, so to wrap up this talk, every algorithm can be coded using three simple constructs, sequence, selection, and iteration. With them, you can build all the algorithm that you can imagine. And it's really great to understand them. So what was an algorithm? An algorithm was a sequence of unambiguous executable steps defining a process for solving a problem. 
And we, we learned that we had the mandatory requirements, defini definiteness, effectiveness, and finiteness. And of course, it must be correct. And additional properties were performance and machine independence. We looked a little bit how we can describe algorithms in natural languages, where we had example of the cookbook, and pseudocode, which is closer to real code, and flowcharts as a graphical representation. And for me, really, the beauty of this is that a programming language is such a, a standardized description of an algorithm that is executable by a machine. So I was really intrigued personally to be a, become a computer scientist by knowing that once I design basically such a program, written down an algorithm that does a tedious task, I could execute it as many times as I wanted. And I never have to do this tedious task again. And this automation really is what I see in my life. Improving helps me improving my personal you know, effectiveness and get rid of tasks that I dislike. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Um, leave us some comments and thoughts if you have some. And we are looking forward to welcome you in Reading for any of our open days, visit days, and I hope you enjoy the time.